Clint. Okay, my name is uh, Clint Ludeman. I am a product marketing for data center devices. And uh, we're here to talk a little bit about kind of where the changes are in the data center and then a little bit of how our devices have to be uh, modified and designed for these changes and the new workloads that are being done in the data center. So again, forward-looking statements, things I say may or may not materialize. <laughs> um, quick overview on here, we'll talk a little bit about the data center up front and some of the things that we're seeing with our customers, and then we'll kind of spend half on the SSD side, and we'll flip over, we have some of the new products we announced, and then we'll talk a little bit on the last half on the hard drive um, side, and, and then we'll wrap it. Hey, we start looking at the universe of the of data. It's expanding rapidly. Um, kind of just think back, kind of set. A lot of you guys have been in the industry maybe for a long time, not so long in there. But if you think of Western Digital, it really made um, its history. A lot of it was around the controller. There was a day the controller was smart, the hard drive was stupid. Um, this was kind of even before I started at Western Digital. And being a controller and having the controller technology was a game changer. They really enabled the IBM compatible market with, with storage controllers. Then they actually were a champion of the integrated drive where they put the smarts of the controller onto the drive and to do it. And I joined Western Digital as my first tour of duty there. I was right out of college. It was like 30 years ago, a little over 30 years ago. And I joined the team that was doing the servo controller. So you had another controller doing their own controllers. So the servo controller, if you recall, before servo, you had what was called a stepper motor. And a stepper motor basically was a screw. Talk about going to Home Depot, Luke was not wanting to go to Home Depot. Well, we went to Home Depot, bought big long screws, stuck the head at the end of that screw. And if you wanted to move the track and go three tracks, you had to turn the screw three times. If you wanted to do 1,000 tracks, you had to turn the screw 1,000 times. Latency was obviously an issue. It was a long time and it made a lot of noise. And if you compare that when you start thinking of the theme of NVMe and how much you kind of where we're ending up at today, um, NVMe shortens that. We don't have any screws attached to our to anywhere in there. I don't think there's any screws other than holding maybe holding the model together, right? Um, so it, when we designed the controller, the servo allowed us to go from a 40 megabyte drive to an 80 megabyte drive. And that was pretty big in the time. Again, this is 30 years ago, and think of back in decades, right? Now I realize how old I am that I can actually remember all these stories. And in the last 10 years here on my, my second tour of duty at Western Digital, we've gone from a one terabyte drive all the way up to our recent 15 terabyte drives. And we've talked about sampling even a 16 terabyte drive. So we've gone from megabytes to gigabytes to terabytes in this time. It's huge. And if you start looking at what we've done in the last few decades and how much the data center has changed, from having big screws with heads on the end of them to what we have today, to the flash, to be able to getting up to you know, multiple layers of, of flash NAN. <clears throat> Same thing on compute. What once took 250,000 years to compute has now been able to change to where today, and in the future you start looking at it, it's only gonna take a day to compute. So the data sets obviously are changing. The amount of data we're going through is just, it's huge, it's mind boggling when you think of how far we've come and how this seems to accelerate. The Internet of Things is starting to bring in more data points coming in. More data points means I want to do something with it. And if I want to do something with it, I usually want to do it very quickly. So there's a lot of different things on the slide on here, but the idea behind this is between, you know, even the data and the privacy and what you're going to need to do with that data is data is changing. And that means the data center has to change from what it was in the past to be able to handle these new workloads. And that's really kind of where we're looking at it from our side when we look at product marketing is where's the market going, where are our customers going, is to understand what are these new workloads and how do you design the right device for it uh, to be able to do that. So if you look at storage and you think of now what is the data center, how important is storage? Well, storage is 37% spend of IT. So it's a pretty significant spend, and therefore, if you're going to go and design a data center, you really want to work with somebody who fully understands storage, and that's really all that we do. Obviously, the reasons for doing that, you look at videos and infrastructure, changing it. Then you look at the, the middle there, the hybrid. What's kind of meant by hybrid? We kind of have your traditional on-prem, and you go, yeah, I, I get the on-prem piece. And they go, okay, but then you got the public cloud. Okay, that's new. All these mobile devices are connecting to the public cloud. And then you got the on-prem guys going, well, how do I actually connect to the cloud? Maybe I want to have a private cloud. So now you have a private cloud, public cloud. 
And if you've read the announcements in here from some of the big uh, public cloud companies over you know, the recent months, they're now saying, well, maybe we can actually have you know, devices that go in on-prem that connect in on-prem directly into the cloud. So we have all kinds of things. 90% of organizations you know, that we talk to are going to adopt some sort of this model. But every one of them has different use cases. You've got traditional types of storage arrays to things that got to scale out. Um, you look at the customization, compute intensive, cold, hot. All these workloads, depending on what they're doing, requires different size um, types of devices to be able to handle uh, the workloads. And again, huge growth in there. The revenue growth at a 13% CAGR, um, the exabyte growth at 40% CAGR. And you kind of go back and think back to that model of we went 40 megabytes in the screw drives to be able to move the heads around and how much things have changed that doing a 40% more data, more opportunities to figure out how to monetize that data um, the workloads are just dramatically changing, and we're kind of on the forefront of that, especially as we start to transition to more and more SSDs. So um, we'll talk a little bit about both hard drives, but hard drives are not going away, and we'll talk a little bit about that, as well as the, the fast, low latency, being able to get that data and be able to store it and access it very quickly um, on the SSD flash side is also very important, and I'm going to be there. There's rumors of the death of the hard drive. <laughs> We just heard them yesterday. Just heard them yesterday on there. <laughs> well, I'll talk about that in a minute. I got, I got a, a chart on that. But one of the things I will say up front, kind of just to directly answer it, is that there's different types of hard drives, obviously. You know that. 15K, 10K, and I'll get into kind of showing the comparison of that versus the capacity enterprise hard drives. So those 15 terabyte hard drives and, and 16 terabyte, that's where the bulk of the data. And so you're really going to see this wide set of data. I mean, deep, have uh, these big buckets of data. And then when you want to move it and start to do computations on it, you start to see kind of another layer where you're going to need to fast data and you're going to be able to need to analyze it. And both of them you're going to need because you just can't store enough um, on the flash side cost effectively. So this idea here is, right, is imagine now a typical customer of ours um, is doing some neat new app. So I'm just using an example here of a ride sharing app. If you take a, a ride sharing app, you've got millions of users and you've got billions of transactions that are going to occur. So imagine yourself, you know, you're in downtown San Jose, and you say, I need a ride. I need to lift someplace. I just came in from London. I came in from someplace, Germany, France, Italy. And all of a sudden, I'm going, now, i got to figure my way around. I got my app. Now, that app is probably stored on a phone that has flash memory in it. You probably downloaded it. That downloaded file was up in a library someplace. Well, did you need fast storage or slow storage? That library is sitting there. People are, are millions of users. There's, there's tens of thousands every day doing new uh, downloads. So you kind of have this static thing that needs to be done and, and downloaded quickly. But then when you're standing on the street corner, um, I'm, I'm laughing on, on here because my, my example that I was kind of talking about is I'm standing on a street corner and I'm really worried about um, where I'm at. So I want to be able to get access very quickly um, to get my ride. Now I'm six foot seven, so I'm not really worried about how quick I do, but I certainly don't want to stand around, right? You're, you're, you want to get the access. So when you access it, you need to find out, I've got a ride. I want, um, is there a driver available? How do I connect that driver? How far away are they? Can they get me to where I want to go from where I'm at? Very instantaneous, right? So there's a lot of transactions. So the whole location services, dispatch, displacement, you need very low latency. NVMe SSDs are perfect for that sort of thing where I've got some real-time data I want to be able to do. Now it happens to be a Thursday. And I go, well, how many people are look like me looking for a ride? Is there a lot of people looking for a ride? Or does it happen to be Thanksgiving? And maybe nobody's looking for a ride. Is there a lot of rides on Thanksgiving because everybody's going to see family? Or is there no rides because everybody's there watching football. So the whole thing on, on looking at the analytics, batch processing, where you want to go multiple years of data to find out is Thanksgiving going to be busy or is it not going to be busy? And you're going to want to do these analytics and these machine learning to figure out how many riders, how many drivers do I need and make sure that you don't have a mismatch. And if you do, you price it appropriately. If you don't have enough drivers, you want to raise the price. So this is the kind of an example where you've got something from millions to billions the data sets are basically fast, you've got slow, you've got things that you want to do and keep, and you need different types of storage. And that's really kind of the key takeaway is it's not the death of the hard drive because you're going to store years of data. You're not going to store it in DRAM and have a power outage go out and lose everything. Where there are places in here when you might do a quick transaction, you might have DRAM and flash backed up um, in those sorts of uh, configurations. 
So key thing is you need a trusted partner delivering across all of the um, technologies that are out there. And so we'll have to figure out who it is that's talking about the, the death of the hard drive. <clears throat> this chart here kind of really addresses that sort of head on, because um, I've heard it before. But again, you start looking at the top, so I kind of have an AND, um, both the NVMe and SATA in the top, so the NVMe is shown kind of in the red in the dots there, but that's the flash coming down. You know, the timing is general. You start to look at this where somewhere in there there's gonna be a crossover, and you start to see the crossover of 15K hard drives. And again, a lot of the 15K hard drives today are still server-based. They're very low capacity. It's a 300 you know, gig hard drive, so it's very, very slow. Um, low on the capacity, so your dollars per terabyte are not very good on that. If you look at the 10K, which is the yellow line, we still believe that there's gonna be a gap in, in the pricing. You may argue there are some TCO things that say, well, maybe I don't need to over-provision as much and I can get a little more performance, so I don't need to buy as much capacity on the hard drives, and so there's some of those arguments. You know, and so it's gonna maybe encroach um, a little bit down there on the 10K. But the key takeaway is when you, at least when you write up and start talking about hard drives, do differentiate that a 10K, 15K, you know, something that's used in on-prem data centers. I was in a, I was in a meeting right? uh, a couple of years back with uh, a leading <coughs> uh, manufacturer of disk drives. I think it might have been a predecessor, predecessor or a prior acquisition. They were saying they thought the, the transition over 15K would have happened in like 2017-ish. It's taking a lot longer, and it looks like it's taking a lot longer to transition the 10K price. This is cost price thing. What, and you attribute that to the development of things like helium and mammer and things of that nature, or, or is it just that the, uh, the NAND is not scaling fast enough to, to you know, the, the concept was it was going to beat out all these guys. Yeah, and this is sort of kind of the point of actually having a more of a balanced view. If all you have is flash, you know, then it's like, oh, it's just gonna totally take out a hard drive and, and flash is gonna continue down. The reality is, is, is it is competitive and flash does have its opportunities and you're starting to see it encroach on, on the high end. On the, the 7200 RPM, which is the capacity enterprise, what you mentioned is tr true. I mean, there's new advances that are, that are continuing um, and I'll get into some of those in the second half of exactly what we did uh, to be able to do it. But it is that continued ongoing um, driving to higher and higher capacity points. And that's how you get the best TCO. Because any time, and if you think of a dollar per terabyte, um, I always say, as you know, you can build one data center full of 16 terabytes or two data centers full of eight terabytes for the same capacity, kind of setting performance aside, right? What do you get? What do you save in that 16 terabyte full data center? The complete data center, all of your infrastructure, the parking, the lights, the building, you know, anybody has to do any maintenance, the security, it's like all that cost just disappears when you can pack more into the same space. And that's what's driving the, the public cloud infrastructure is they see that, that PCO. Now I said performance aside, is at some point you may say two data centers is faster than one and that's really where the flash starts to come in. Most data centers today are not using the 10K, 15K for scale out type applications or cloud applications. So in a lot of ways they built their um, their new data structure, their new infrastructure to scale with capacity hard drives and flash. The on-prem, and what you're talking is the 10K, 15K, um, that's much more of a traditional and you just have a lot of uh, traditional storage or traditional storage arrays and why it keeps chugging on is it just, there's old apps and they just keep, keep going. And at some point, the new development, and we see it within our own company, maybe you see it in your own, where you used to have an exchange server and now all of a sudden you're, you're using something online and you're going online and go, my mail's online, I'm not even managing my own mail server anymore. And you just start to see those transitions. Let's talk here a little bit. This is a chart showing um, NVMe um, interfaces um, with the focus on NVMe, but you see the blue on the left is SAS and we're starting to see that SAS will continue. Again, same discussion point I had before on the on-prem, um, continuing to drive the SAS market. It lasts a little bit longer, but even in the end, in 2022 there, the green, which is on the right big bar there, is NVMe will eventually go. But really what we're focused on and where we see the near-term um, opportunity is if you look at 2018, 2019, and there in the middle is you have SATA. The SATA has been pretty constant. It's starting to shrink a little, but you look between 2019, 2020, 2021 out there, really SATA is going away. And what that means is SATA is moving to NVMe, and we're starting to see that. All the customers I talked to out here in the Bay Area, they're all going, they've all got designs that are all working on uh, moving to NVMe, 
And part of that is the latency. It's faster, and they can start to build the applications on top of it um, that make sense and kind of get away from some of the legacy infrastructure. What about the cost of the actual interface in that scenario? Because what's people, people that keep saying that you know, SATA drives will be cheaper, um, and there's an implication that the interface is cheaper, and maybe the control is cheaper. How is that affecting this model? Is that saying that NVMe will be on a price point equi equivalent to SATA in the future? I think it, it's heading that direction. It's not there, but we think it's heading that direction. And it's one of those things is once you make the conversion, you then, if you don't have the apps that take advantage of it, you don't need it, right? And so, but we are seeing that people are looking at, I've got this infrastructure for the next five years, how am I gonna scale? And as we put the hardware in place, the software developers all the way up the stack are starting to optimize and, and say, you know, now that I have a lot of hard drive or a lot of SSDs in there and a lot of flash, I'm realizing my latency is too long and they're starting to shorten those paths and be able to, to do that. We'll talk about that in some of the use cases. If you think of virtualization, some of those where now that you actually have hardware that can support it, then there's a drive that they can actually take advantage of it. So it's and, kind of two, twofold. Will we talk about the scalability side? So obviously NVMe is much more direct connect into a into a server, whereas you can scale out SAS and SATA a lot more at the back end of a scale out array, for instance. Mm -hmm. Will we get a chance to talk about how that might change? I, I don't know whether that's... Yeah, we have some of the, even the NVMe over Fabrics and some of the, the later sessions okay. on there, they'll, they'll be able to address some of that. So to kind of understand where our, our products are, uh, we segment the market this way, and it's sort of useful as you look from, um, again, all NVMe, looking from left to right, we kind of have what we call a VRI storage, very read intensive. What it kind of implies is you're not doing a lot of writes. Specifically, you're not doing a lot of random writes. And this is where our first product, we just announced uh, two new products here on Tuesday. And this is where the CLSN720 fits, kind of designed for content delivery, server boot type applications. The next one over is a little bit more endurance. And you have what we call read intensive, so that's more of a mixed workload, 70-30 type uh, workloads for read-write. And this is really gonna be the biggest segment right now. We think it's, it's kind of the mainstream. It allows you to do a lot of writing, um, you know, as opposed to where you kind of get into caching on the other side. That's where our SN630 product um, that we mentioned. So these are the two new products that we have uh, that we'd like to talk about. The uh, CN, CLSN720 is optimized for, for sequential write workloads, but it only supports 0.3 drive whites per day. I mean, I, I don't understand this logic here. The, the point on that, and I, what I was trying to say earlier, right, is that you're not doing a lot of writes, not doing random writes. It does okay kind of when you get into a sequential write as opposed to a random write. So if you're going to fill it up with a library, you can be able to. per day, I mean, you're not going to be doing a lot of sequential writing. Correct, correct. But from a performance, if you look at the, the benchmarks on the sequential read, sequential writes, it's much higher on, on a sequential writing, where if you actually are trying to do IOPS-driven writes, that's really to kind of more call out the, the, the pro as opposed to the IOPS. Um, but definitely, to your point, the mainstream is if, and what we actually find is people do boot, and they say we're, we really want it as a boot device, so we really want this real, real thing, and all we're gonna do is boot, and we almost need it read only. We're gonna write the image, and we're done with it. We find out and we talk to customers, they go, well, we did that as a hardware team and then our software guys put a database on it and then they started writing it and then they started wearing the things out because the endurance wasn't enough. And so they're going through this learning cycle of thinking, hey, I just need a cheap boot device, small capacity, and then it's not quite big enough because the software guys are in a different department and they're going, hey, it's there, I'm gonna use it. And so that's why the mainstream U.2 form factor we really see um, being a kind of a key. Piece there, Ray. Is WDC uh, providing any tools for people to understand their workloads? Because I, I find that there still are a lot of people who just don't know. Yeah, we find that. I mean, most of how we do it is through a direct relationship. We do have a field um, technical group that actually can work with our customers directly to do it. I'm not sure if we have anything from a public, hey, here's a utility to run, but we do work with our customers and find a ways for them to optimize. And that's how even on the hard drive, we can actually go in with an analyzer and see what's there, tell the customers and say, hey, this is what your, your software is actually doing. And if you, by the way, maybe go from a Q depth one up to Q depth four, for instance, you might get a lot more performance. They go, oh, hey, I, we didn't even realize that. And that all of a and is able to improve the performance. We certainly see that a lot on the hard drive side as well. How about support for U.3? 
don't have it today, but I think from a standards uh, body, we're always looking at futures. And I, what I will say on this is you don't see, you know, what comes next on here is we're behind the U.2. We are on the standards bodies for the next generation um, products. And you will see eventually here the um, EDSFF format, which is kind of the, the, long, the long stick on there, is something as a future format that we're actually uh, looking at adopting. And would you well. look, at, look at all of those then, the, the longer versions and the short versions? Uh, E, E1.L or whatever it's Yeah, called. you, you E1.L, and we think that's going to be the primary thing from a storage standpoint. Mm -hmm. You just don't get enough storage on here. Um, the E1.L um, actually gives you, you know, it's plug and play, and you can pop it in and out in front of a server. These are all the two and a half inch form factor. It looks like a 10K, 15K drive or an SSD in there. Still very popular. 80% of the market we think is still going to be this. Um, but you think in the next year, 2020, is when you're going to start to see a lot more of the EDSFF, E.1L, and the short types of, of applications yeah. that are coming out there. So the next two um, categories we have is kind of our caching and compute. So just touch on that. Um, that's kind of their higher end. You get a lot more of the dual port, a lot more writing um, on the dry writes per day. And then we have a, a product we recently introduced here at the end of last year, RME200, which has 10 plus dry writes per day. and kind of tries to bridge a little bit and say, how do you use current technology of a flash drive with NVMe to be able to bridge the gap to DRAM, which is a pretty big gap. But how can you bring some of these performance levels up and offer some cash? And we have a, have a, a product in, in that category as well. I'll got a slide on that a little bit later. So let's talk about the, the two new products we just introduced. The, the first one we talked about is the, the 630, and then we talked about the 720. And you can see here that one of the key things is that this is vertically integrated. It uses our own flash. Um, it uses our own controller. It uses our own firmware. And so this is really kind of a key commitment from Western Digital. That's why I kind of tied in the story originally of Western Digital has a history of doing controllers, where there was a you know, a, a drive controller to a servo controller is that's really kind of uh, part of our DNA. And this is our first enterprise-based controller. So each one of these does have a unique controller, but we do have our, our first play. It is architected to be able to go and the, the node transition from the 64 to 96. So when we actually go through that transition in here, when we have the right time to do it, we can kind of swap out the back end, be able to upgrade and keep a, a real solid foundation on the front end, as well as be able to do uh, more advanced features. So as NVMe, we're just starting the transition. A lot of customers are going, hey, now that I'm starting to get it, we're actually starting to move. How do I move it to the next level? We want more features, and we want to take advanced features of NVMe and figure out what those next generation features are. A lot of discussion on that, and that's why we feel this is really going to be a, a solid thing going forward. Uh, key points on this, again, we do use our, it's TLC uh, based NAND, so it is our, our 3D product. And again, this is the 720 uh, version that's there. Got the low drive write, so the 0 0.1 um, is there, and that's really for a random write. If you actually do sequential writes, you'll get a little better performance in that, so kind of do an even comparison. Uh, we show it that way, so it's got a 0.75 sequential endurance. So, so again, that's why it was called outray of, of the difference um, that was on there is if you go sequential, you'll actually get more right. endurance out of it than you would if you do random. So you got to know your workload or you'll, you'll misuse the device. Um, air RAID 10 to the 17th, pretty standard, 2 million MTBF. Best in class, kind of the IOPS per watt. So again, real low uh, power profile. And then, of course, our encryption. We have uh, Opal support on that and as well as the ISC. So that's the instant secure race. And that's where you actually have the device. It has a key. If you want to redeploy or retire the device, you tell it just to change the key. It erases all the data instant on there. So that way you can actually either get rid of it and dispose of it or actually uh, redeploy it into a, a new configuration. So it comes standard. And then we have some uh, tools that come with it. So again, key are some of the use cases that are there. You look at content, delivery, video caching. So I want to point out kind of the, the bottom one there, lower endurance requirements for, for content that resides in the cache for days and weeks. So this was the example I talked about earlier as I download my app to my phone. Well, if it's residing someplace, that app probably isn't going to change very often. And you may want to, if you had it stored on a device like this, or a movie library, or a uh, audio library, you're going to write it once and be able to, to bring it down very quickly. And so this is kind of that sort of a caching. Some CDNs 
are, are when they're caching and they don't know what they're caching, they're actually doing a lot of writing. They might have a 60-40, 60-30 sort of a, or I guess 70-30, uh, read-write cycles on there. And so a CDN that's doing a lot of writing uh, would really want to use our other product, where this one here is more for a, a, more of a, of a static library, so knowing the use case is important. Cloud gaming is just another example that we have up there, and again, that's saying why would you use a SATA SSD instead of an NVMe if you need low latency? So if you want the fastest performance and you want to load up the next gaming of an online game, load up the next level, and you're basically streaming that game, then having very low latency makes sense. That's kind of an internal optimization to where milliseconds actually make a difference. And where are you talking about that being, where is that device being used in that instance? In, in, a, the, in a cloud well, gaming. So this is where if you're doing a cloud, cloud gaming. Cloud or whereabouts is it? In the, in the cloud, not on the consumer side. So if you're in the cloud and you're streaming a game, you actually have to load up all the levels and load everything very quickly because you still got to be responsive to the user. And so if you end up adding additional delay on the processing side at the server side, before it's going down to the user on the other side of the, the internet. And that's kind of an endurance. And we actually have a, some customers that are involved in both of these use cases um, here. And of course, the IoT, smaller devices, you have a low power and can be able to do that. So again, on, on the, the 630, we got capacities one terabyte to four terabytes. Again, U2 dot form factor. Two different configurations, a tunable endurance between a 2.0 drive rights per day or 0.8. Essentially, to get the 2.0, you just trade capacity um, for over-provisioning, so you reduce your capacity and get higher endurance. A little higher on, on the watts on the 10.75, but in this class, it's still on the lower end of the power usage, and this, is, of course, is important when you have multiple drives in a, in a system. And then instant secure race, again, is, is another feature that's uh, required by the enterprise and, and the enterprise specs. And again, this is a 3D TLC uh, product as well. The so use cases for this, again, you have the virtualization. So if you're using some sort of a hyperconverged infrastructure, this is a great product for that. Again, in, in a case like that, you actually have a lot of data coming through. And at the bottom of it, it just looks like a bunch of random writes. So that other device obviously would not be good for that. This here can handle those sorts of workloads very well. The other one I'll talk about here is kind of the object storage. If you look at object storage, you might um, often deploy that where you have a journaling drive, and then you have your storage. And the idea is, is the data comes in. Very quickly, you want to put it into a journal drive, and um, journal, and then move on. And then in the background, it's either going to replicate or erase or code it or put it out to all of its storage nodes. Those storage nodes then could be either your lower endurance storage SSDs if it's a small data set, or it might even be a hard drive if it's a much larger data set. So you kind of cache it and send it out to the, the rest of the cloud. This talks a little bit kind of just briefly. It's a new product that we talked about, the memory uh, caching, memory extension device. And this is kind of a device that says, let's take what we are doing today. We can crank up the endurance. Luca kind of talked of how you can actually adjust um, between SLC, MLC, and the endurance levels, and QLC all within the device. And so that we can actually do a very high endurance product um, and then put a software layer in there. And we're basically redirecting access into the RAM to the flash drive. Sort of like an NVDIM or something like that? Or? It, it's, as you can see, the form factors, it's with an add-in card or a U.2. So it's not going and changing the form factor. <laughs> but the concept of how do I, instead of putting stuff in memory, put it on flash is similar. Um, other than we're now going through the NVMe interface. So if you look at like Memcache, Redis, and some of these are, are benchmarks are typically your uh, memory-based uh, database structures, and you're looking at performance on there, anywhere from 85 to 90% of performance of what you would get if it was a full DRAM. So now you can have more storage, you can put bigger objects, more of it, you're not constrained by DRAM and still get pretty close to the performance. And of course, the price difference between a flash and a DRAM is, is gonna be a little bit different um, to do that. So you're able to take advantage of that versus loading up on a, a full DRAM or not having enough DRAM in your server to do it. So the difference in performance is kind of based on the, the paging profile kind of thing. Is that how you would say that? Cause... Yeah, because you're, you're, you're going from the, what was in the memory, it, what was in the memory and if you pull out and you, and you pull the right information and you're able to cache it, um, 
how, how can I cash, cash the information and not lose the performance? And if you can pre-cash it and pre-fetch it, then you're able to still maintain most and, of the performance. And, the, and, and it's a combination. Software. You're not all flash. You're still using the DRAM. And what sort of software goes along with this? I mean, is it something that plugs into a Linux kernel or? Yeah, it's a Linux-based uh, software. It comes with the drive, so it's a bundled uh, uh, piece of software that is able to go off and to manage that. So, um, Is it kernel-based? I believe so, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's yet the, the lowest level to be able to I just want to update it. my blog post. I didn't have that detail in it. Yeah. Um, so if you look here, this is our, our full storage line here for the NVMe products coming in. Um, the SAS that we talk about here, you know, we do have a 15 terabyte. It doesn't cost the same as our SMR 15 terabyte hard drive. Um, but kind of that, that whole going into the future is that we actually have SSDs now that are as large as the hard drives in there. Certainly a cost disparity, but obviously the performance that you're going to get on this product is, is much better than a hard drive as well. And then I kind of mentioned into the, the write up there. The EDSF new form factors are coming. A lot of the controller technology that we have is going to allow us to be able to, uh, to quickly adopt new form factors as they, they become available. Let's take a pivot here, kind of switch from the SSD side, and we'll go look at the hard drives in the data center. Uh, key technologies that we've done of being able to get higher and higher capacity points really is getting access density and raising the access density. If you look at SMR, that's really a big area that we've been investing in. You can see almost a 16% increase as you start to look at, say, a, a 12 terabyte hard drive that can actually be bumped up to 15 terabytes by using SMR. If you look at the size of the disk, what we've been able to do, they're not quite as big as the, as the wafer here, but we've actually gone from a 97 millimeter to a, or 95 to 97 millimeter. So we've actually made the disk a little bit bigger. It's still the one inch form factor, so we're constrained in there, but we've given you extra area. And then, of course, we're not at 96 layers, but we're at eight disks. We're, we are, we are um, packing more platters in. Original drive we worked on was, was a two terabyte, or two disk, 80 meg, and now you're getting an, an eight disk, uh, 15 Terabyte. terabytes. So um, the damascene process, and this is kind of a key thing from the header and reader uh, process. This is something different from the dry pull. And the dry pull basically is you would you know, put down material and you etch away at it. And as you etch away, it kind of leaves a rough edge. With the damascene process, much more like a semiconductor process of today, where you just build layers on top. And the layers allow you to have a very fine head. You can then make sure that your bit and your pattern is very clear. And the key point about the damascene is it's kind of the basis for our energy assist. So we're calling that kind of EPMR as a, as a notation for it's similar to the, the, the PMR that we've used in the past, but it's energy assisted. Um, from a microactuator, superior mechanical design, now that you have all this, and what's in the middle is the helium where we shipped over 40 million units of, of helium. Because having helium makes the inside turbulence go away inside of the, the drive, so it's much smoother. Now that you're smoother, you can now write with the damascene process, very crisp bits. And then with the microactuator, that's actually where we, we went from you know, a single arm going in there. Instead of being managed by a screw, it's managed by a servo. You're able to go do a dual stage, and you're now able to um, break it into two pieces, so now you got two things going in there. We move from a milli-actuation down to micro. It's now it's like breaking at the wrist, and it gives you much finer control. So we kind of move the control further out on the head. We're one of the first to be able to do that. Yeah, Tom. I had a question on uh, micro-actuators. Yes. Um, another company do making hard drives has said they're going to have some shipments this year of that, the products like that. What's your plan on that? Do you have I think what you're talking about on here is, is the difference of a dual actuator, which I'll talk about a little later, is the notion of uh, this is a single arm, so it's a dual stage actuator, so I'm talking about the dual stage piece, dual stage versus uh, a slide that I have at the end, which I'll talk about, which is now taking that stack of eight and how do I actually split it, and this is kind of called a dual actuator, and we'll, we'll talk about that the clutch, though. Uh, when I get to that slide. Yeah. Um, so right, a lot of these things all come together, and it's really it's all the pieces that are are starting um, to, to be able to give more and more bits on the disk. And that really gets into why capacity enterprise drives are here to stay, is there's a lot of technology vectors that are going into cramming more and more into the same uh, form factor. The biggest one we're starting to see is SMR. You may have heard about that, the difference between SMR and PMR, or sometimes we call it CMR for conventional magnetic recording is back when I started, bits were long, and you actually had an, L whoops, had an LMR, and they actually moved the bits perpendicular, so you can start moving the, the magnets closer together. And so that's where we are with the PMR. 
Now, all the technologies still use PMR. When you go to SMR, the difference is, is we now have tracks on the left, and the tracks used to be side by side, gaps between them, kind of concentric circles. And with SMR, you basically pull those together, and now you're shingled. And so they're overlapping. You write a wide path, and then you can read the narrow with what's left over. And so the right takes a wider spot. This kind of ties into why you eventually need EPMR and energy assist to get smaller and smaller writing. Uh, but today, we're able to do that. And that gives you the extra capacity that you need to do it. What you lose on that is like a roof. If you want to unshingle something in the middle, you know, shingle's bad, I've got to replace it. You have to unshingle your roof, replace the shingle, do your random write, and then re-shingle back down. So today, you need a PMR or, or the conventional way of doing it, non-shingled, non uh, to do random writes. You lose random writes when you move to SMR. Most of the guys today that are implementing this are taking a look at it, and they've written the full software stack to be able to take advantage. And they've sequentialized the data before they get to it, and they write it once. And any garbage collections where things get erased, they handle in the background. You see uh, drives with both SMR partitions and PMR partitions. That's something that. Yeah, today all of our drives are either 100% SMR or 100% or the other. There are standards that are out there that are being talked about where it's a dynamic hybrid SMR uh, product that would actually allow you to convert between them. And so we're involved on the standards body. So there is work at, at is there a possibility to do it? Uh, the downside is, is you may not be optimized to do one or the other. Yeah. And the other issue is, is it's a lot of difficult, ju difficult just to do SMR, period. And, and you got to kind of write your, your stack to do it. <laughs> One of the guys that did do it was Dropbox. Um, they did some announcements with us. We've been working with them very closely. And they have a thing called Magic Pocket. And that's their software stack that they created. And they're able to take advantage of SMR. So they did the development work once. They own the stack all the way down to the ratio coding. Their Magic Pocket software um, does. There's a lot of blogs that they've done on, and on the architecture of it. And what you're able to then do is now that they've done this once, is now when we actually go and have SMR products, um, they've already done the investment, and they can now get less expensive storage using SMR as a capacity point. But it is a lot of work. It's not a trivial thing. We do not see it in, in the traditional uh, storage array type architectures because it uses what's called host managed SMR, and the host managed means the host has to manage it. And by do doing that, that takes uh, um, a lot of software and knowing your data and your workloads. So you're predicting SMR is going to take off and beat CMR? Yeah, we, we actually think on here that, that you're starting to look is that over time, um, and again, realize that, that in this, CMR is still growing. So it's, so it's not as not if it's going, and again, from an exabytes, but we think the SMR is going to take off in places that, that, that use it. Now, we're in 2018. We just did, did a little bit. There's actually one set of pixels. If you get real close, you can see that. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 2019 is really the year. So we've been talking about it as an industry. What you got to look at and start to see is as we get adoptions, this is one of the first guys that was able to control their stack. They have a very specific application. <laughs> and with that specific application makes it easier. And you can see why it's difficult to say, can I do a general purpose thing that does any application? A little more difficult to do that. But You're seeing that growth coming from the hyperscalers, not your average enterprise. Yeah, definitely on the enterprise, we're seeing very little in that because of what I just mentioned, is that they, don't, they, they just don't control. <laughs> and they'd like to, and they're trying to figure out if maybe they could. And it's really finding the workload. And I'd argue that they, you know, Dropbox figured out how to do that and made it very easy. Um, it gets tougher as you go unless you can have a bigger architecture and you actually develop it um, from that perspective. What are you calling low cap? In 2018, it looks like low cap is like 75% of all shipments. Yeah, I think we had on there was um, the low cap was considered about 10 terabytes and below, I think in this analysis that was on here. So in, in reality, when you're on SMR, people tend to do SMR at the highest levels. You know, so you're using the highest capacity always on there. But I think in this, when they did the cut, was was at a 10 terabyte. So, so I think uh, it's Al from WD. I think um, the other comment about SMR is the workload. And we see video and civilians is the one that drives a lot of the SMR because that is the workload that can accommodate that type of drive. Yeah. What's, the, what's the capacity advantage of SMR versus CMR? Like 20% better capacity? Yeah, it, it sort of ranges. I mean, depending on the capacity points um, that you have, we're showing kind of 16% was shown on the chart, is that if you look between today, our 15 terabyte is based on a 12 terabyte platform. So you have 12 to 15, so it's a three extra terabytes. 
we're often seeing two terabytes, two to three, and we're trying to be, be, you know, make that a larger gap as you go to SMR, but that's sort of where it's at today. So if you look at kind of the three terabyte gain is what you're gonna get. Now what happens is longer term, and why I'm, I'm kind of saying we're trying to make it bigger, is now that you know things are just overlapped with cracks, and I'm only writing it once, I don't have to worry about things like adjacent, adjacent track interference, or ATI as we call it, which is as I write, as I write a track here, I gotta make sure that I'm not erasing the track next to it. And as the tracks get closer together, this becomes more of a problem. Well, when I'm shingling, I'm basically kind of writing everything once. I don't have to deal with that problem. So that allows me to solve and take a whole engineering set of problems that we used to have to worry about and go, I don't need to deal with that anymore. And now I can optimize differently. And so as long term, that then gets back into our controller and how we actually design our servos and how we actually design the data layouts to be able to compress that data even closer together because you're solving a bunch of different problems and making sure that you know, your data that you write is, is reliable and comes back this time. Yeah, so uh, again on the nomenclature, is the low cap probably uh, the high speed uh, SAS drives, for example? Um, it would be more, it's still all capacity enterprise. So this does not have a okay. 10K. Now, from an exabyte standpoint, um, it, your, your 10K, 15K probably wouldn't show up there much <clears> anyway, because most of those are 300 gigs. Anyway. So, so even if you overlaid those, it would still be pretty small. And presumably the CMR is going to move into your MAMR drive. Will the uh, SMR also be MAMR? Yeah, I think the, the, from an SMR, um, CMR um, standpoint on there, they can both take advantage of any of these new technologies from the energy assist uh, across the board. So there's no real Do you see any place for that. TDMR anymore, or has that pretty much died off? TDMR. So TDMR, two-dimensional magnetic recording, that's in our current products. And the idea behind that is to actually put two read heads. So you write it once, and in the same way that you got two eyes and you're looking at something, and um, one is one eye can be bad and you can still see, um, you can also get in and you get a better depth perception. And that's essentially what happens. So if you have two read heads then, and you're putting it in there, then you actually are looking at that signal from two different areas and you're able to do noises reduction and cross cancellation of the, of the signal processing because you're able to take two signals, come up with the true signal by eliminating <coughs> So that technique is still um, being used and it's from a read process. When you talk about the whole write process on the, the energy assist, which we'll get to, and I'll, I'll talk in two slides here a little bit more about that. Um, so again, we have 15%. Um, percent. We talk about a little bit of, of, of our 15 terabyte, 7% read and write performance gains over the, the 14 terabytes. So we went from a 12 terabyte standard platform to a 14, 12 terabyte standard platform to a 14 terabyte SMR. And then we added the 15 by pushing the bits together a little bit, we were able to actually get a little bit better uh, performance out of the drive. Again, all using the helium uh, technology. So if you look at kind of some of the things that we've accomplished on here, um, kind of looking behind us, we talk about having the first eight terabyte or eight, eight disc, eight platters, uh, capacity enterprise drive at 12 terabytes. Uh, when we went to the 14 terabyte and the 15, we have the TDMR heads in this time frame. So yes, it is something that we're continuing to do. And looking forward, we talked about, we've actually are sampling, uh, this is now future, we're sampling a 16 terabyte uh, product to some of our customers starting to use energy assist. So let's talk a little bit about energy assist, right? What's the problem? The industry has a physics problem. We're making the bits smaller and smaller. And so despite all the fine servo mechanics that we do, the bits can only get so small. And what happens is if you get them too small, you need a smaller magnet to be able to, to flip that bit. Well, if you need a smaller magnet, then it doesn't take much to flip it back. So we kind of have this issue of if we make it too small, then anything else can erase it. So how do you make it stable yet flippable, right? So the way to do this is, is to say, well, what if we added energy? So if we shortly add energy, change the coercivity of the media, so the media doesn't want to flip, but we put a shine, a little bit of energy in a little dot, the magnet can actually be big, the little dot under there is the only thing that's gonna flip. So we shine, put energy, flip the bit, remove the energy, and it's now solid again. So that's essentially what kind of this whole concept of what energy assist is and what everybody in the industry is doing. Now we chose kind of the, this concept and it shows a picture of, of, uh, of using ma MAMR. And MAMR is using the microwave assist recording. 
And the way we add in, instead of adding heat like you would with a laser, is kind of the difference between an oven where you put your hand in an oven afterwards, it's very hot. Put your hand in a microwave after you've been cooking, it's cold. So there's not a big temperature change. And so by being able to kind of focus on the MAMR, we were able to say, you know, we know where we want to go. Let's start to work through different techniques. Every generation of hard drives requires invention. This stuff is not easy. These guys are discovering new things and, and new physics, um, solving physics problems every day in this mechanical device. And they go, as we went through this path with MAMR, we were able to come up with different building blocks. And so some of the building blocks we have um, are being used and are going to be used in our next generation product. And then when you look specifically on the microwave portion of the building block, that's something that we're looking at, at coming out in future products. So our current products do have some of the building blocks. It's some of the things so, that we've so found I, on the way. Some, yes, uh, some discussions in the industry about MAMR versus HAMMER, and, and MAMR's got a, a limited lifetime versus HAMMER's got this unlimited lifetime. Why is, why is MAMR believed to be limited? I guess the right term I would use. I, I think that, that you know, two things is, is that from a near-term perspective is that what happens at the end and you look out, you know, another decade or so, it's like we're on a road, you know, to figure out how to get there. Right. We believe it has legs. The reason really we chose it um, is major. because we knew between, between now and when we needed to go that going to hammer added, you know, in this case with an eight disc, you put 16 lasers. You have a reliability issue because you have a lot of heat to deal with, and it's something we still see um, issues with. We still invest and, and have, have teams looking at, at this, so it's not like we just chose it and we're blind to what's going on. We just don't see it being the solution that's going to give you something cost effective to your customers today over the next several generations. So the MAMR was something that we could say we could go there, we can build, leverage our Damascene process, which is something we have to build complex structures, not only the, the spin torque oscillator piece of the structure, but other things that are required to make a spin torque oscillator work. And on that path is gonna give us reliable products for the next several generations. And that's sort of why we kind of embarked on this path and that's really what we're delivering. So another following question. There's uh, another vendor out there that's come out with a, with a MAMR drive lately. Are, so you have this joint venture with Toshiba on Flash, I guess, but there's no joint venture like that for drives. Correct, correct. Yeah, so it's completely, their, their development's completely. So how big is a bit at the moment with the magnetic recording? I'm sure, what was the? Uh, how, how big is a uh, bit physically on a, on a HDD? I think it's in the order of, of nanometers. I mean, it's actually very similar geometry of the bits that you get in, a, uh, in an SSD. So um, just uh, uh, to confirm, because it looks a little fuzzy here, 2019-2020 uh, plus, that focus is at least uh, near term on MAMR, not HAMMER, is right. that for real products? Yeah, yeah. We're definitely working through that, and our, our whole energy assist is kind of solving the energy problem and how we do it. There's different components, and so it would be misleading to say, oh, our next product with EPMR has the, the spin torque oscillator. We're actually saying it doesn't. Um, on that, and that's why we're kind of using the term of just energy assist as the umbrella for all of these. But the problem is real, regardless. I mean, we're all trying to solve the same problem as how do you put energy most effectively in a small bit, and mm -hmm. how we solve it is still, there's work to be done, and it's a road we're on, and we don't know where that road ends or how far it's gonna go, um, but we've been doing this for 30 years since I've been in the business, and they started before me, so. Do you, do you have any lab demos uh, on, uh, that you can talk about with regard to density you can get with MAMR? I don't have anything on there. I mean, I can, we can say that we've demoed drives in the past. Yeah. Um, I meant, you know, recording demos, you know, with uh, air rates and that kind of thing. Yeah, I don't, I don't Even know. Even if it's in a lab. Okay. So you're saying 16 terabytes, 18 terabytes, that's an eight platter configuration. It's not like a 16 terabyte platter or anything like that. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah, that's a total capacity of, of, of the drives that are on there. And all of our drives to date are all at, at an eight disk uh, capacity point. In a two and a half inch form factor, is that? All three and a half, all three and a half. All three and a half. Yeah. And part of all that's sealed and it's getting capacity enterprise, so it's really driving at the bottom uh, versus the, the top lane, which is really being encroached on by, by the SSDs. So we talked a little bit about the, um, the dual actuator, and again, this is a split, kind of want to invite, we are going to demo this as a technology demo at OCP, which is at the Open Compute um, in San Jose here in, in a few weeks on there. And again, the idea behind that is, is that if you have um, 
if you have issues with what we would call an access density, how many IOPS per terabyte can you handle? And how much, how much do you actually need? And as you have gone in double capacity, we really haven't doubled performance on the hard drive side. And so at some point, some guys are coming back to us and, and saying, you know, I'm getting to a point that I'm not getting enough IOPS per terabyte. If I had a 10 terabyte drive and you're running 100 IOPS, again, mostly read IOPS because the right IOPS you can cache. We have media caching and a lot of techniques to, to raise the, the, the right ability. So it's really read IOPS. And you say, okay, 100 terabytes, and I, or 100, 100 IOPS, 10 terabytes per drive, you're getting 10 IOPS per terabyte. That's getting to a point that maybe I can't handle much less than 10, or I can't handle much less than seven. Every software vendor has their own kind of pain point of, of what gets to where I just, I'm not getting enough data off the drives. How do I optimize? So putting two together allows you to split it. We're using SAS today, so it's a kind of a dual LUN sort of thing, so we're kind of going back to the old school. So fortunately, all the on-prem guys created this uh, very robust SCSI <laughs> uh, protocol that we're actually able to go off into leverage, and it really has two drives in one. Each one is independently, and so you still got to manage it from a host to say, well, I want my data spread out between the two different disks um, to be able to it's do a, that. It's a random question, not a sequential question, because I mean, sequentiality-wise, you would have, with more heads on a similar cylinder, you could actually do twice as much but from a random perspective, it's a different game. Well, you're still, as long as the data is spread out, you have two, two drives, because you know, two drives are still going to give you overall performance. If the data resides at the top drive in, in there, then you're not going to see a benefit. Increases? It actually increases the effective data rate. Oh. So you're using this to actually increase the effective data rate out of the drive, correct? Yes. Yeah. And of course, the power savings you, you get. Um, the other area, I mean, by having two drives, you have a single motor um, instead of two motors on there. And then the, the slot cost. I mean, if you have a full rack and you want to have a slot, you can either put two eights or put one sixteen, for instance, that same sort of a, of a concept out there that you're able to uh, um, get twice the performance out of a single slot without having to pay for the extra overhead on that. No capacity on here. I, I used an example of eight, eight to sixteen for uh, just a discussion point. Use a couple. Yeah, the, the right we're showing technology des demos right now, so there's no no productization uh, time frame um, that's done. But it is solving a problem that some of our customers are starting to have. Other customers, and this is kind of where where the paradigm is, right? Is I'm going, wow, would I rather actually have SMR? Would I rather focus on on different things? Or is do I need performance? And so, it's kind so of both that, actuators that can be active reading and or writing data. Correct. At the same time, with it's it's really physically two separate drives packaged in the one yep. container. Yeah. Yep. Two chips. And yep. two two controller chips and two. Yep. Yeah. So I, I'm missing the point of the whole thing because you can't scale in capacity because yeah, you don't have bang. more. It's got to be. Uh, platters in in, in in the drive. And nobody cares about performance of these drives at the end of the day because yeah, even if you double. move from 100 well, to 200 uh, eight, IOPS, really, we have we have True. devices that, with million of IOPS now. That is what you're getting. Thousand. But those 200 IOPS, which is if you think of 100 to 200 IOPS, is a 2x. It's significant, even though it's all slow relative to flash. No, I totally I, agree. I get on it. That. I, but if you're looking at a drive and I go, I have a bunch of photos and they're stored. How many users can I get, and how long is it going to take me to access that data? If I can get 2x the performance, then that's a pretty Does significant Does this require like a next generation increase. of SAS or something like that? Because, I mean, you're doubling the, the data transfer rates out of these things and stuff like that. No, and it, and it kind of goes to, Nico, if it's your, your, your same, same issue, right? It's like six gig SATA, the six gig is fast enough for, for hard drives. As you start to get into a dual actuator, you start to fill that up. So when you go to 12 gig SAS, you got plenty of room even on the SAS side. You don't really even need that for the hard drive data. I mean, you're at 250 megabytes per second. You now get twice that amount. If you, and we're, we're saying it's probably closer to 1.8. But, the amount, but you're still within the, the bandwidth of even a SATA. So even going to SAS, which is now 12 gig, you got plenty of, of bandwidth from that perspective. Unlike SSDs, which are kind of blowing through those and maxing those out. This yes. remains an experiment anyway, because most of the uh, you know, end users already solved it with cache or multi-tiering. No, abso stuff. absolutely. So, so maybe you don't know if there will be a real demand for this kind of product. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I totally agree. I mean, if you look at your software stack and you got to look at it and go, do I have a problem? 
And what we're hearing from some customers, and again, not all, and definitely I'm not saying all, right? Some customers are going, wow, the way our stack is and re-architecting, if you can make it twice as fast, that would actually help us. Because we're just getting into, you know, um, 100, you know, 100 IOPS is about where we're at on a read. And you look at a 10 terabytes, this whole 10, 10 IOPS, can I go down to seven IOPS or six IOPS? You know, that, that's sort of kind of the, the, the question at hand, right? So and it's, it's not a problem for everybody, sir. It's certainly. really a TCO discussion because you really need to be looking at slot count, and as you say, the, you know, the cost of a slot, yeah. cost of the drive, cost of the capacity, power, throughput. So it really depends on if a customer's good at, uh, clever enough, or even a hyperscaler's clever enough to know their, mo their model and know exactly where they're sensitive, yep. this might absolutely be a, a bonus for them. Yeah, I mean, if you're totally packed down, this is even, we've had a couple OEMs go, maybe, and again, this is your, your point, not like, hey, this is, I need this and I'm doing it, but it's kind of a maybe, if I had a rack full of drives and I got twice the capacity, I wouldn't yeah. have to go to an all-flash array. because I have also have half of so the again. MTBF, because there are two actuators, so at the end, it, it could break. Why do you have half the MTBF? Well, a drive user, what is, one million hours? You have two drives it's here. Two million, two. So potentially you have, uh, statistically speaking, you can break two drives, and when you break one of them, but you've got you have to, to change the, the, the entire drive, physically. There's a challenge with data protection. RAID, if you've got two separate drives, but they're physically one drive, that, that's the issue, right? I mean, yeah, if you want to pull yeah, out to half the drive, it's, it's a lot every tougher time to do. You, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. The, the real MTBF, so you, you break two drives, even if you break one drive. And you change yeah. half yeah. of it. Tom, Tom, Tom wants to, to uh, oh, um, Just to add something to it, so it's the same drive. So the, the uh, the MTBF is going to be the same. Yes. Now, what? It, what? But yeah, the advantage. But, but you, you address two drives. But the advantage in terms of reliability and implications, one of them is, is that the rebuild time is reduced by roughly half. And as you get into these really huge drives, it could take a long time um, to recover oh, no. the data. Why no, is the rebuild so drive? Why think is about it as two drives packaged in a single slot, and every time you break one drive, you have to rebuild two drives anyway. But it's not two drives. But it's only one drive. No, but, it's, but you it's are replacing drive, two but drives when one drive breaks. And if one drive access. really breaks, you're actually probably destroying both of the drives. Because if there's a head crash problem, it's going to affect the whole damn thing. Yeah. So, so to be honest, I mean, so most of these, on when you look at it and you think of RAID, well, where does RAID typically live? Four terabytes, eight terabytes. When you're looking at where this problem comes, I notice like my example was a 10 terabyte, is that when you start getting to higher capacity points, that's where you start to see the pain point. So what we're kind of discussing is, are you going to have a 20 terabyte in a RAID? And what we're finding, and really where some of this demand is coming from, and if you go to OCP, you'll see some of the suppliers that are talking about that are, are behind you know, some of the, the consumer side of it, um, is, there, is looking at it really from a higher capacity, <laughs> capacity point. It's not trying to be two drives. It is. It's one drive, and the failure is one drive. One drive. It's just that it has a higher capacity, <laughs> right? Yeah, the equivalent is, if you think about an NVMe drive that has many, many parallel accesses to it, and you lose one part of the drive, you've lost the drive. You haven't lost part of the drive, you've lost the drive. So yeah, the MTBF is the whole thing. If you have two actuators, two, two, two chips, two controllers, two everything, they look like uh, as two drives. But it's but a single package. It's, it's, one, it's, it's one drive. Physically, it's one drive. Logically speaking, there are two drives. So. Hey, we'll, we'll, let, we'll wrap that. This, this debate could go on for a while on here. So. Um, <laughs> Everybody, you show everything as, as a dual actuator, but really is that plans to make that multi-actuator? Yeah, why stop at two? Three, four, five actuators, or one per, one per one platter, platter even. Mm -hmm. I'll take that idea back to our, our <laughs> you guys on, on being able to do it here. Okay. So, yeah, have every head on, a, on its own independent thing on here. So, I suppose it's a possibility. Okay. We, we have decades to get there. Okay. Right? So anyway, I really appreciate your time. We have a full product line. Again, hard drives and SSDs together is really what we're doing. And it's not one at the other. It's really both of them. So.